Today, I'm talking to Jack Ellis, the co-founder of Fathom Analytics, a privacy-conscious web analytics business that I personally use for a lot of my web properties. The company that Jack co-founded with Paul Jarvis competes directly with Google on their linchpin advertising product. That's a pretty tall order. And we will chat about Jack's role in a growing successful software business and just how much he hesitates to go from coder to manager at this very point. We dive into choosing reliable dependencies to power an always on SaaS business with high expectations and how to deal with migrating customers from Google to Fathom. But before we dive in, let me thank the sponsor for this show. Imagine this, you're a founder who's built a solid SaaS product, acquired customers, and is generating consistent monthly revenue. The problem is that you're not growing for whatever reason, lack of focus or lack of skill or just plain lack of interest, and you feel stuck. So what should you do? Well, the story I would like to hear now is that you buckled down and somehow reignited the fire. You got past yourself and the cliches of started and started to work on the business rather than just in the business, you started building an audience and moved out of your comfort zone and did sales and marketing, and in six months, you've tripled your revenue. That would be a great story, but the reality is not as simple. Situations may be different for every founder facing this particular kind of challenge, but too many times the story ends up being one of inaction and stagnation until that business becomes less valuable or worse, worthless. If you find yourself here, or you think your story is likely headed down a similar road, I'll offer you a third option. Consider selling your business on acquire.com. Capitalizing on the value of your time is a smart move, and acquire.com is free to list. They've helped hundreds of founders already, so you would be in good company. Go to acquire.com and see for yourself if this is the right option for you. And now, here's a deep dive into a successful technical SaaS business. Here's Jack Ellis. In building Fathom Analytics, you, you've chosen to directly compete with Google on one of their linchpin products for their whole advertising empire. And I think that's a bold move. I was always very impressed that you went for that. And I wonder, like for you as a, a business co a co-founder and uh, an engineer, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about the fact that you're doing the engineering work of a whole Google division with a very, very small team? How is that going for you? Oh, what a great question. Yeah, okay, cool. So it's going good, but we're obviously running into the a point where we've got a huge amount of customers and there are different segments within our customer base. And one segment is happy with everything as is and they maybe want a few tweaks. You've then got other segments that just want more. And you sort of have to decide what you want to go for. And with each each feature you add, and I've said this before publicly, but each feature you add it unlocks this this new potential that you didn't know existed. Like people get hooked in on that feature. And then suddenly you have this roadmap that one developer cannot do. And so we have started hiring. Um, we have one full-time engineer. We have a part-time senior engineer who is about to get into our code base. He's already handling EU isolation for us. And honestly, this is very topical because I can't do everything anymore. And that's kind of... that's. Like that's not that's not um, something I'm used to because I'm used to just sitting and coding and I can ship like crazy. But now you know we've got these enterprise deals that are coming in and we're saying okay we should at least explore these and maybe we don't pursue them but we should explore them. They're coming in for multi billion dollar companies and so I'm handling that and dealing with the you know whatever it may be and sure we could outsource it but there isn't enough to outsource so then my engineering time's going there. And then I've suddenly got 30 pull requests that I've got to review. And I'm thinking, at what point do I get to sit down and do some code? And so I'm very much, and this is being completely transparent with you, I'm very much transitioning into more of a manager CTO role. And we are planning on hiring more. We're very careful with how we hire. We don't predict growth and say, oh, we're going to grow this amount so we can afford to hire. We're very careful. We make sure we've got the money by a long shot um, before we start hiring. So that's how it's going. It started off, you know, indie hacker. You can, you know how it is. If you built your yeah. own SaaS, you can sit down and hack, but you definitely know about the fires that happen. That, that fire can take a lot of energy and that, that big feature you wanted to focus on, you haven't got the energy or the focus or the time for that because you're putting out a fire. And I know you can relate to this because I've read your stuff. So that's how it's going. I think, um, I have to let my ego go a little bit because I do take a lot of pride in the fact that, you know, I like coding and, 
and it's absolutely fine. So that's how it's going. We are going to grow. We're not going to grow into Google, but we're going to grow in a way that we can keep up with customer demand and expectations and that sort of thing. So it's interesting that you that you have to shift your perspective a little because I do remember on the podcast that you have with Paul, Paul Jarvis, um, you were talking about staying in the job you like and not promoting yourself out of your job. That was something that you elaborated on because that was a, a topic that you had, right? And reflecting on where you've come from and where you are right now. So this seems to sound like you're just shifting your perspective a little into what needs to be done to keep the business growing. Yeah, you've done your you've done your research of it. Um, yeah, okay. So you're absolutely right. I that was my view before. It was I want to stay in. You know, I like programming. That's my job. Ultimately, I care more about our customers being happy. And I genuinely we have awesome customers. And, and I've said before, um, like sure, the the ones that you know IBM or whoever wherever else they don't talk to us. They don't. Well, they talk to us a little bit, but it's not the same interaction as we have perhaps with you as a customer or, or someone else. And you get that really nice relationship. That gives me a kick. And so if we can make our customers happier and we can get more people away from Google and we can, you know, fill in those gaps that people say, oh, I really want this feature. And to do that means that I need to take a management role. Well, my my top priority is the customer. It's not, oh, am I, am I um, coding? Because like, I can live without coding and occasionally I will code. I'll still code. Like today I'm going to code some SSL stuff. But it's like I, my full-time job isn't coding. And so I have to realize that, like, if I want to make customers happy, that's a transition I need to make. Alternatively, and me and Paul have spoken about this, and you know, Paul's not dumb, Paul knows his stuff, but um, it's a case of, okay, then, well, if you want to code all the time, that's absolutely fine. We'll bring someone in to take over your responsibilities. And I didn't like, I don't like that. Like, I like, I like being involved in the, in the direction. I like being involved in the management. And I realized, oh, well, actually, do a hybrid role where you're coding way less or, or maybe none some weeks but you're able to steer the business and, and be involved in everything else. So yeah, my opinion's changing all the time and I'm changing my perspective a lot, keeping an open mind. And I'm seeing how it feels because, uh, you know, I don't know what it's going to feel like. I'm, I'm only just starting to do that. So honestly, we'll see. And uh, thank you for, for pointing out how it's changed because that's very interesting to me as well. I forgot well, that. That, honestly, just listening to your podcast that I've been doing this for a long while, I mean, ever since we had the puppy, and that's now a good year or so, uh, I've been puppy. walking a lot. For, uh, yeah. You know, I oh, haven't good, before. Good. I was just sitting in my office, but now I'm just out for an hour a day just walking around with this beast good. that sniffs everything and will try yeah. to eat it. <laughs> so while that happens, I'm just ingesting the the stories and journeys of other people and yours mm. is one of them i mean if you were to release more episodes please then it would be more regular but you know it's we're back on it dude. we're back on it trust yeah. me we talked about this we're uh, back on it good <laughs> but no pressure i mean there's still you still have a business to run right i'm i'm always talking to people who are, who are thinking they want to build in public the building is an important part of the building public part not just the in public part mm. right talking about something <laughs> well you have to do something to be able to talk about it so oh, please I, do I interesting stuff so you can have interesting stories then afterwards but what i'm what i'm trying to get to is over the the time that i've been listening to the, the podcast and your stories you can see how perspectives change and that is i guess the prerogative of a founder you just have to adapt and adopt new perspectives whenever you need to change but the perspective on what you want it to be probably is still the same like do you still consider even though you're now going into more managerial work do you still consider this a lifestyle business for yourself oh absolutely yeah yeah you should see the conversations behind the scenes um so like the enterprise stuff paul doesn't want to even explore that like he doesn't want to put any time into that for me it's a case of let's explore it and see what it's really like and so we have this balance of we do explore things we're not afraid to explore things and see how they affect our life if we land say an enterprise deal that i'm currently kind of working on which is i don't know is it don't want to say it's i wouldn't call it working on it's just happening um mm -hmm. if it if it happens and it turns out to be good well, there's a lesson learned. We can actually cope with doing that because it's a substantial amount of revenue from one customer. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't work, then we course correct. And we're always course correcting. And it's not just us anymore. So we're obsessed with the people who work for us having a good life. We have flexible hours. They can work whenever they want. We just had full-time customer support hired. He can work whenever mm -hmm. he wants. Just get the work done. So the lifestyle extends across the entire company, and it's very mm -hmm. much a lifestyle business. And no one should be getting burned out or stressed or any of that. And that comes before anything. And we're we're, he we're a healthy company. Like, why do we want to 
ruin everyone's lives and try and chase these ridiculous goals because we've got well, we haven't got investment and that's a nice thing we're not chasing yeah. these ridiculous goals where we're stressing and agonizing about hitting them some people like that and i'm not saying you just got to be aware of what works for your lifestyle because for some people a lifestyle business would be i need to grind in order to feel complete in order to feel like i'm yeah fulfilled and that's like I don't know. Like talk with your psychiatrist if you've got a problem with that. If that's doing, if, if that's if that's fine for you, I don't know. Be aware of the limits of that. Is what I always think. But I always come back to what's the lifestyle for me and Paul, and then it's like what's the lifestyle for the people that work for us, and that's where we that leads us really. Yeah, I, I guess not having investors makes this very easy to put this value at the core of your business and not in investor returns or anything like this. Right? It's, yeah, exactly. It's, it's a big important thing. difference. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad you do this. But w one thing that comes to mind immediately when you talk about being bootstrapped, but also having enterprise customers, you have to guarantee a lot of stuff, right? You have an, you need an always running service at that point, and you are on a bootstrap budget still, right? You don't have these uh, gigantic in investor millions just laying around. How do you do this? Let's maybe dive a bit more in the technical side at this point, because I'm, I'm, I'm just super excited. As a an ex-developer is kind of what I would call myself, because I rarely get to code. Just like you, I moved into the managerial position of my own life. Now I kind of outsource these things to other people because I have a media business uh, that I'm taking care of. Yeah, so you do. Yeah. Very little coding, sadly, to be done for me. But I'm still excited about this stuff. And you've been um, both in what your courses are doing and what you're constantly sharing on Twitter and just how good Fathom is as a product. I'm excited to know how do you keep this always running service on a budget? What's the tech behind that? Yeah, that's a good question. And a lot of engineers will self-host things and they'll, they'll build it themselves and they'll manage it, do the updates, that sort of thing. Um, from the beginning, I was very aware of my limitations and aware of what I wanted to spend my time on. I have no doubt in my mind that engineers at these hosting companies, like originally it was Heroku, now it's AWS, and I think it's a mixture of things, but um, those engineers are better than me. Those DevOps engineers, whatever you call them, the people that update the servers, that all of that stuff, they're better than me. And I'm not going to be able to compete with their level of knowledge. So we actually pay a premium for the most or the highly available services. So we pay, people would laugh at this. We pay, so each page view that comes in, it goes through a Lambda request. People say, oh, that's, for us, it's it's this beautiful managed service. And sure, you, you can use containers and stuff, but it's just not something we've got into. And maybe that's the future. But for now, we're using Lambda. So Amazon Web Services basically maintains that for us and keeps it up to date and makes sure that we're, we're good to run. And it's auto-scaling and blah, blah, blah. And then we use a uh, enterprise-grade database, which we've got a lot of support from their team as well, where this database can scale to like, millions of requests per second. It's used by uh, one of the biggest banks in the US to handle transactions. Like it, it, It's a big deal, this database, and, and we just it's highly available. And so the only other thing we have is EU isolation for GDPR compliance, where we have Hetzner running servers. We have uh, someone called Lucas who manages that. And Lucas is like a top tier DevOps engineer who we're just lucky to, I'm lucky to know him and to have that relationship where we could actually bring him on part time. And so Lucas manages that and he is the same level as Amazon Web Services engineers. So that was about me knowing my limitations. And we want to pay a premium for the best possible uptime. We don't want you using, uh, losing your analytics. And, and that's a really big point where we stand out. Our competitors can't match us. They, they, sh they you see their downtime, right? Our down, we don't have downtime. Like, actually, that's, that's, you can't say we don't have downtime, but we've reduced the likelihood of downtime significantly by investing in a premium service, basically. I, I love that. Perspe my, that's my perspective too, particularly as a small business not building things that other companies oh, have whole yeah. divisions for is just a smarter move. I remember when we built Feedback Panda, we had, we had a similar choice. Like we could host a database ourselves somewhere, right? Mongo HQ or whatnot. And we, we had it um, just locally on, on a Hetzner server. Being a German company living in Germany, that was quite a yeah, reasonable choice at that point, but we didn't. We actually got a, a database as a service, which was... Yeah, uh, Compose or something, which was Mongo HQ before, but like a database as a service, essentially, right? They run it, they, they maintain it, they update it, they secure it. And that was the largest part of our expenses for the longest time, <laughs> right? Like yeah, the, yeah. the, 
a couple a couple Docker containers that run the application on the Google Cloud too, just auto scaling as well. Should we need it? But the database was where the value was because we had a product that people were using in a shared capacity, right? They would share the feedback templates that they put in there. Yes. I'm not gonna explain it to you. It doesn't really matter. But that, we had a system where people shared stuff, and the data was the most crucial part of why we should even exist. So we treated that as the the prime citizen of our business, and that data needed to be secure and reliable and attainable and all that. So I think when we sold the company, I don't really have the, I'm not sure if I'm even allowed to say these numbers at this point, but I think we paid like $4,000 a month uh, to that company that hosted our database. And that was probably over 50% of our expenses at that time. You had some serious, serious traffic then. I mean, that's, that's yeah, a lot. We, of- we had a lot of data. I mean, you should know everything about a lot of data. <laughs> I was going to ask you because our couple hundred gigabytes of text data probably pale in comparison to, to what you are <laughs> working with on a daily basis. But, yeah, you know, yeah, like, sure. it, it was just a, a managed service that was uh, quite expensive, but also very reliable. And we were, we were like, even these $4,000 that we would pay every month, that's still cheaper than paying for, you know, a couple servers somewhere and all the tools and an engineer to deal with it that can only work eight oh, hours a day. Sure. What year was this that you what year was this that you would have been paying this? Twenty seventeen to nineteen. Okay, so I mean and, that's, and that was in database world, that's you know, a hundred thousand years ago <laughs> for databases. <laughs> so you were in yeah. a time where you I I'm more privileged because I've got all these databases available. You're in a time where like we aren't where we are now that's it's like what's that six years ago so um that would have been harder to find something as well like now it's like you single store it's, it's, yeah I, I'm, I'm just f- figuring out that is actually six years ago holy <laughs> yeah <laughs> and that's that's a lifetime for databases yeah that's true so, yeah that's expensive but it's worth it because it, it powers your business I don't think uh I've ever heard of uh of single store before you talk to uh to the Twitter world about it uh, recently i guess right and back back then i don't think it did, did it even exist in 2017 so they existed but- as mem sequel and then they had a had a big customer i don't know if this is public so i'm, I'm not, i guess I, I shouldn't say but they had a big customer who it was viral everyone was using this customer and they wanted to do analytics and they were already doing like um, in memory stuff and then they branched into analytics and then the rest is history so now you've got this database where you have the oltp and the olap all in one all in, all in the same table type, which is just unheard of. So, yeah. Yeah, we, we didn't necessarily need that kind of feature as being just a CRUD app, really, right? Like people would write data into the system, they would pull it out and sometimes deal with it, edit it, save it back. That was it. So, so we were a Postgres drop, essentially. So our little SQL database uh, was just sitting in there, uh, but well-maintained by somebody else. And that was totally <laughs> worth it for us. That's what matters. It, it wasn't as expensive in the beginning, right? Obviously, we started with a couple hundred bucks a month, and that was that was where that started. But uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's honestly one of the best choices that I have made in my developer career or software of business developer c- career is to outsource these parts that when they break, everything breaks. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm glad I, I didn't have to deal with that. Is, is there anything anything like that that um, you also put into third parties instead of building it yourself? Like, what were the choices that you made in your, your past, in the beginning of the business, where you were like, oh, we could build this ourselves, or should we, or should we not? Yeah, so um, I know that we do. So, for example, when you share your dashboard publicly, we have a image you know the og image that goes onto onto twitter we have that built externally because i don't want to build a bunch of php gd stuff um oh crikey you're really testing my my brain here there's so many things going on and things that are active in my brain we do so we default to looking for third-party providers when there's not personal data being passed around and because it will save us time i will and, and, and that's great and a lot of the times that solves your issue the one downside you really have is that if there are issues with that provider or if there are things you want changed and you're not paying them that much money you don't have as much sway whereas if you have it in-house you can change it and so it, it, it's nuanced so but we do default to it but it's nuanced that's all i'll say um, and we do try to do it where possible i just can't think of where else we do it off the top of my head because we can't do things like ip spam checks because we're not going to pass that ip to a third-party provider and we do that all on our server um no i can't think of much to be honest but we do that's, default that's to that. all right it's just it's just my brain here yeah and i was actually wondering because like since fathom is so focused on privacy and also serving essentially a, a global community of businesses that have 
their own local laws, you know, uh, about what bus- what data businesses have to or should never uh, collect from their customers or from their users. Have, how do you juggle with this? Like the the potential conflict of these these privacy and law and data collection implications. Yeah, I mean, so we have our target audience, right? And it, you know, North America, Europe, um, like uh, it's 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 worldwide, sure, but. We're not trying to comply with laws in China that where they want us to collect data. So anything that compromises our values, we won't do. So if a, if a government says we want you to collect this about something, we're not going to do that. And so then it's just okay, we're not going to be compliant in that country. We're very focused on the EU and North America. That's our primary customer base, and the UK obviously as well. The EU and the UK. Um, so we just follow. We have a privacy officer who is. So our privacy officer is one of the smartest people in the world on this topic. I'm not even joking. She is incredible. And so she is just, you know, finger on the pulse constantly, keeps us updated. And if there are things we have to do, like uh, California, they had some privacy law changes. And then, you know, we've got, I uh, can't say who, but a big media company um, emailing us in the state saying, you know, can you adjust your DPA to accommodate this? So if we're, if we're missing something, the lawyers from other companies will tell us and we'll add it in and then we'll evolve. But we do um, have the privacy officer in place and we have our, you know, our legal team and that sort of thing. I'm not personally worrying about that constantly. It's not something I'm thinking about. It's really a case of say they say, oh, the EU US privacy shield is invalidated and that's the legal stuff. So now we can't use Amazon web services for EU traffic if you're going for radical GDPR compliance. GDPR compliance is like a spectrum, right? No one's perfect. Uh, or maybe someone's perfect, but most people aren't perfect. And it's very hard to be perfect. So if you've got customers in Germany, and I feel like you know this, they want that radical compliance because they know they're under scrutiny and their their um their DPA doesn't mess around and they will inf- they, they will enforce the law. And so they'll come to us and they'll want that extreme that EU isolation that we offer. And so they know about that and they won't compromise. Um, yeah, that, that's, I'm just thinking, I'm just going through like, so EU isolation comes, oh, we have to build that. So from a technical perspective, I'm involved in it. Okay, so now EU US privacy shield is invalidated. What do we do? And that's where I have to think of a solution. And in our case, we put a proxy layer on Hetzner that completely like, hashes up, removes the IP address, all of that stuff to protect it from US surveillance, which is the issue in, in, in this scenario with the GDPR. Um, and as some people, US customers will not necessarily care about that. And that's fine. It doesn't matter. They have that anyway for their EU customers. So it's one less risk for their business. Um, but I come into play when the law changes that affects our business in that way, if that makes sense. I'm not looking at every little change that's happening. Our privacy officer um, helps us with that. How often do you have to update the product? Like how often do these things come in, like changes in the laws that you need to comply with? Had a flashback there. Yeah, so not too often where it's so major. The EU US Privacy Shield was substantial. The Schrems 2 ruling, substantial. Like, sure, it was a marketing opportunity for us because we were already, we were building this in anticipation. And you know, you talk about luck in business. We were building this and it just happened that we'd built it and no one else had built this. And then, because either some people were going EU only, we went, oh no, we don't just want EU only. What about American visitors and our American customers? We go through the EU or the US, depending on location, to make it faster. And so that was a huge change. But how often do we have to change it? Not that often, to be honest with you. Oh, cool. That's good to know because that that would, you know, I remember I had to integrate certain changes into our browser extension for the business that we had that were unannounced and fairly common like on a on a weekly basis the thing that we tried to integrate with would change and nobody would tell us that it was going to happen so you know there's a certain cadence to having to deal with things you didn't expect and i'm glad it's not that much for you because that just makes the product less brittle right you don't want a product that is constantly being pulled back and forth between laws and and uh, certain integrations one thing that i found extremely interesting that you were talking about uh, we're talking about a couple months or years ago was the migration from google into your product and i always wondered um how was that how was how much fun was it to build a migration from such a a violator of privacy laws into a very privacy first product uh what did you struggle with and you know did, did you enjoy that process or was it a chore so are we talking about the google analytics importer here yes 
yeah yeah so that hasn't even shipped yet that's about to sh- that's shipping soon i should say mm-hmm. um th- that was a complex process because google samples data and so a lot of people just say oh, okay we'll just grab this and then you can't really do anything on the data because it's google's data we went the extra mile and this is why it's taken so long and and why it's but it's more sophisticated um you can actually filter on the old data. It's not just, like, if, if they've sampled it and we haven't got the data, we can't do anything about that. But the cool thing is when you've got the data, you can filter on it still. And it's a very sophisticated import. And there, the Google API is good enough. It's a bit kind of tricky to understand with the limits because it's all over the place. But it, you know, it was, it was a good project. Um, I think our, our full-time engineer actually built the majority of that. So I can't take too much credit for that. Um, but it's coming along nice, and that's the next that's the next big thing we're shipping ahead of uh, Universal Analytics being destroyed. And there's a few other um, pieces that make it the most sophisticated solution on the market, but I'm not allowed to talk about them because Paul will shoot me. So, <laughs> did Google make it hard to export that data? Oh, good question. Uh, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't say it was hard to export the data. It's really how the data is. Um, the fact that it's sampled is an absolute joke, but I get why they did that because of the scale, and it's it's a it's a it's a free you can't see that free product. Um, so I wouldn't say they made it hard to export the data via the API as such. The the limits are a little bit confusing, but I'm not going to. We've also done something there, which which will be interesting to a lot of people when it when it drops. But I wouldn't say they made it hard necess- The OAuth stuff, I thought they made that unnecessarily complex with like the approval process. Um, for an application but no there's no evil play there that i can comment on Hmm. good (laughs) yeah i mean it's it's always like uh, with these kind of entrenched businesses right it's hard to um you know make the make a make a case for why you would even want to share the data that you have so where, where do you see the um, analytics industry going? Because I see that your business is very much focused on privacy, and I love that. B- being a European at heart, even though I live in Canada, which is also a great place, but the GDPR thing was something that was very welcomed by a lot of people in the European IT industry and beyond as well. So I, I see that there are the, the legal limits to what you can do, but do you see also from the customer side that people are becoming more aware of the necessity of privacy? Is that something you see in the future? Oh, absolutely. I mean, things like Cambridge Analytica, all the scandals that are happening. And, and when people are using Google Analytics and, and they think, well, what, is, what do you mean privacy first analytics for Fathom? I always say, go onto your search engine and type in Google privacy scandals and just read read the reports and read the Wikipedia page and everything else. Um, people are becoming more aware. Yeah, they're becoming sick of, uh, companies like Facebook and the invasive, like the, the spy pixel tracking. I said spy pixel, but it is, it is like a pixel that follows you around the web, that sort of thing. Um, what Google's using the data for, how they've used it in the past, what they would do if they weren't regulated. That, that's another thing about privacy laws. Um, unfortunately, people are affected by cookie banners if they're not using Fathom. And that's annoying and it, and it is ridiculous. And I, I do feel people's pain on that. But the the laws are in place for a reason. It's to stop companies like Facebook who would just... The things they do if they weren't regulated, and I'm not a big fan of like, under uh, like unbelievable regulation. Like I need regulation should be calm and balanced, but this did need regulating, and I I do think the GDPR is a relatively um, positive thing. And it's and people get angry at the GDPR. There's a lot of flexibility. There are multiple lawful bases of processing. It's not just throwing up the cookie banner. The cookie banner is often for the e-privacy directive, um, or like PECA in the UK. So it's not just the GDPR. Uh, so people are becoming more aware. That's a huge thing. People are using browsers that have ad blockers in, or not necessarily ad block, but ad blockers, but also um, like Brave, for example, it shows the, the trackers on the page. If I'm seeing Google there, that's immediately changing my view on, on you as a company. And I thought, oh, that's just a me thing. People care about this stuff. People don't like the, and not everyone cares about it. And that's fine. Like, we all care about different things. But enough, more and more people are understanding and caring. Oh, they try to send my data to Facebook. I get really bothered by that. I don't send my data to Facebook. I don't even, I don't have a Facebook account. Don't try and track me on Facebook. It bothers me. And so people say, oh, we'll use an ad blocker. Okay, that's great. That's great for me. I'm in tech. It's great for you. You know what an ad blocker is. 
What about our parents who don't necessarily know what an ad blocker is who are being tracked? I remember my mum went on a website and she was so concerned by the fact that it said hello and then her name on a random website and it was like linked to her Facebook. That really bothered her. And so people are, even, even she was becoming more aware of what was going on. And so people expect privacy. Some people don't and that's fine. Like, you know, everyone's got a different opinion. One thing I will say though, it, I, call it, I call privacy the political equaliser. Because both sides care. I mean, we've had like, political parties, and we've not worked with any of them, but political parties contact us because we have that, that privacy thing. So it's a political equaliser, which is also interesting, I think. And I think people, the awareness will continue to grow, especially with Facebook behaving bad. Um, people are sick of their data being sold. You know? And if you're not, then you won't use Fathom and, and you, won't, you won't pay attention. And that's fine too. I'm not trying to persuade anyone. Like We get people come to us because they already know what Facebook's been doing. They already know what Google's been doing. We don't have to persuade them about that. That's why, we, that's why we've grown like we've grown. People know what Google's up to. So. Yeah, that's a growing awareness. I, I think I see that not, not only in, in websites and you know, cookie tracking and that stuff. I see it in emails too, like particularly sending out <laughs> newsletters to thousands of people, right? The, the number of people who block all email tracking is climbing like significantly and thanks to i guess services like hey hey.com right who automatically block all tracking and then show you right that's uh, one of the benefits of you seeing who is trying to trick you out and i think so i'm still working I'm always working on my thoughts but i think i disagree with david on the all tracking's bad so where i go with this you remember superhuman when it came out they were tracking where you were when you opened it that was bad and that really played into what hay was doing which which was great because that is not okay and i know they changed some things and i'm not having a go at superhuman i read i could not believe that and then you've got for those of us going back years what was it was it hubspot used to be able to track who opened your email and when they opened it i really don't like that like that that grosses me out and a lot of people don't like people knowing when they're reading their emails or where they're reading it from and so i'm okay with uh i have 100 people open my email but i don't know who they are i don't know where they were there's no ip address log and that sort of thing i think that my thought is i'm okay with that and we've thought about that with our product should we have some kind of open tracking but it's limited and then you can get an idea for advertisers or sponsors because you like that's useful but you never get to the level where you're actually tracking who it is that's opening the email. So you immediately say, oh, well, how do I know who to delete from my list when they're not engaging? Well, that, that metrics now, as you've hinted to, is becoming useless because everyone's blocking it anyway. So you can't use that. Okay, then, well, can, can we just, and this is where you get to, can we come to an agreement with the email clients that someone's you know allowed to be in there? And I, I don't know, it's not really something I focused on. I just don't have the same issues with aggregate data um, as I do with individual data. Like I've sent an email to Arvid. I can see that he's doing this, this, and this. And if you do this, then they'll find a way to, like, unfortunately, people will find a way to work around it and they'll send you, uh, like, this is a pixel that represents Arvid. This means Arvid's opened it. And it just, it's a tricky, it's a tricky area, yeah. uh, email. Very it much. It really is. It's so, super nuanced, yeah. right? Like privacy, oh, is. privacy is not uh, all or nothing. Like it's, it's, it's mostly about agencies that that's kind of, that's what I feel like my agency to determine what I want to give to whom that's kind of where my privacy begins and ends right on, on both sides of the spectrum. And I would love to be able to give this one author of that newsletter, the permission to see that oh. I read the newsletter, maybe not see which links I clicked on because <laughs> those are. It was my choice to to explore the content without showing that I actually visited it. But just the open, the read, that that would yeah. be fine. So the fine grain nature of permission, that's something that technology really doesn't allow for because it's not built into the system, right? It's all or nothing. No, you're right. Yeah, either block it or don't block it, which is, yeah, such a shame. But it's evolving and things are changing and we'll see where we get with this. Hey decided to completely block all pixels completely and that was a big marketing piece for them. Um, is that better than having people know where you are and who you are that open the email? I think it's better personally. And that's where I don't agree completely, but I think given the, as you, the technology, given the technology, that's probably a good choice for now. And we'll see what happens in the future because people need analytical data, um, reasonable analytical data to make decisions. Like me, my, my writing, I would never be writing if I didn't know that my content was getting traffic. Cause at the time I wasn't, 
big, if, I, if you can call my big on Twitter, but I have 15,000 followers, which is more than I had back in the day. I'd write an article. I didn't get likes and retweets. But because I was seeing in Fathom that I'm getting traffic to that page, and, oh, people are interested in technical writing. Maybe I should write some more. And now it's just like tens of thousands of views, every article, and it's it, like SEO, all that stuff. And now I know it's worth doing. So we need analytics. And so do email. Oh, I love that. People. Honest, yeah. Honestly, I, I love that perspective because I think like you writing is just like the, the stepping stone towards you creating the courses that you have created, right? As a, oh, yeah. as a yeah, developer definitely. teaching other developers how to use uh, serverless Laravel and single store for Laravel. I want to talk about that too because I, I love the side of you being a business owner in the analytics space, but I equally adore your the effort and energy that you put into educating people around the technology that makes it happen. So... Let's talk about your courses because I, I thought that the latest one you released, uh, the single store one, that, that is an exciting one because I, had, I, I did not know anything about it. But just reading about how you even found single store and this back and forth between Vapor and single store and, you know, like that, but you wrote an, a blog post on it. And then when the blog post was out like a month later, it all changed again. That was super exciting. Can you re regale me with this story at this point? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I mean, th this is a whole process. I mean, yeah, I've got two courses, the, the, the serverless one and then the single store one. So we we were originally on Heroku, right? And Heroku was great and it was hilarious because we couldn't even, well, we couldn't justify a few hundred dollars for our database. And it's so funny thinking back to the early days, but we didn't want to spend loads of money. Like, do we want high availability? I said to Paul, we need high availability because from the start, we care about all of this. And then it was a case of well, what happens when we get bursts of traffic? How do we scale to handle that? Oh, well, Heroku has an option, but you have to pay $500 minimum per dyno. And it, and just then you lose the high availability because you can't have two dynos. And so th this all was happening. And then Taylor Otwell from, from Laravel dropped Laravel Vapor. And I'm like, well, this is insane. So we were, I think, like Project 8 or something. We got super early access to it. And I, you know, Taylor builds good software, so I knew it was going to be good from the get-go. And sure, there was some... It, it, teething pains um things like nuanced things such as uh, reading reading secrets into the environment and having a limit on the api from amazon like these these kinds of things which we ran into because we were doing such big scale uh, eventually and so we moved to laravel vapor and i'm i'm tweeting about it and i because I, I, i'm sharing this i want to share our, our journey because i think it helps people and then i'm getting just emails and i'm getting questions about it and it's more than i can handle and more than i can so I can't spend my time answering all of these. And I think, well, okay, I want to help people. I can probably make some money from this. And I think we just bought a house at the time. And so all of my cash had gone up in that pretty much. And I was thinking, okay, so I can make some money from this and I can help people. Okay, let's set the goal. The goal is going to be to, uh, even if I help 10 people, 10 sales, that's that's a win. And I tried to change you know, the, the metrics to be, I want to help people. And then it just, like, when I launched, it just went crazy and people were really interested in it and people still buy it. And people are now, you know, I've got a, a thriving community on Discord and I, I love it. I really love the community side of things. And we all, everyone in there helps each other and you've got some of the best minds in Laravel and serverless in there, which is just wonderful. Yeah, that's great. And then after that, we're using MySQL, right? MySQL is not good for a lot of things. It's especially not good for analytics. And if you're using RDS for MySQL, you run into issues with the IOPS and you have to pay for extra storage to get more IOPS. And that, that caused huge issues one time. Funnily enough, a company in Germany, they ran a universal basic income scheme or campaign. And guess what? That was quite popular, as you, as you might imagine. And that, that went viral. And, and like, yeah, we can say that. Like it went really viral. And that really made me look at the IOPS and the database and the um how fragile it was, you know? And so I was oh, and then also we were doing high cardinality aggregation. So what I mean by that is we had a customer like uh, J JS Fiddle, for example. And so they had you know JS Fiddle, it's similar to the code pens, those sort of things. Each snippet had a unique path name. We were storing the path name and we were doing a sum group by path name. And can you imagine the cardinality that JS Fiddle had? They, there's this like one of the most popular websites um, for developers and doing, doing snippets. And we couldn't deliver their dashboard. Their dashboard just crashed every single time. <laughs> And it was yeah. it was embarrassing. And the owner of JS Fiddle is the most is like the nicest guy ever. Honest to God, he he just is wonderful. 
um, and he was very patient and I was aware it was broken I'm trying to think you know fix it with background jobs like cron jobs that would pre-calculate it and then we'd read the pre-calculated data and then the German client had even more unique path names because they had a unique path for each step of the universal basic income registration process and their dash and they were using fathom more than um the js fiddle guy was because they'd say you know any luck on the dashboard and the dashboard's not loading and it was embarrassing and so we had to build some custom things there and I, I was also doing a bunch of rolling up and i was like the data was split up and it was being queued and it was just a mess I never dreamed that I could actually write page views to the database and not even roll them up. Just one page view equals one database row. And then now we've got billions and billions of rows, but we can sum across all of these billions of rows and it's just not an issue. I can perform a sum on our entire database in like what, a few seconds to sum our database, maybe 10 seconds, and it's a big database. But yeah, that's nuts. So then we moved to single store got a lot of value out of that completely changed everything we were able to then offer filter by path name filter by referrer that sort of thing and it just unlocked a lot of things for us and people were asking me about it because i wrote about it and then you know i'd i'd hear from people that they were already working on moving to single store based on my story and i think a lot of people move to single store because of that because if we're using it and we're doing the traffic they're going to be just fine on it and then to lots of people and it's funny because this course wasn't financially motivated it was really just a case of i can't help everyone i'm going to put my knowledge into a course and i did and it and it's done well it's more of a niche course but it's still done really well and um now it's out there for the world and i'm i'm done on courses because they're hard work as uh, well you've written book, books books are harder than courses but it, it, you've built course you, know, you built a course you built your twitter course courses are hard work oh yeah i haven't yeah. i haven't got the time so yeah, and that's that's kind of what I what I wanted to ask you too, because you are a full time founder, right? And you're even like moving into management now because you can't handle the load of the actual mm. dev work anymore. Yeah, I know. Do you still want to keep keep teaching in another capacity? Obviously, a course is a lot of work, like as a block. But you want to keep the communities running, or do you want to find other ways to teach? <laughs> yeah, yeah, something's happening. Something's in the works, but. Um... Yeah, so I thought something's in the works. Um, yeah, I, I can't necessarily, I won't talk about it yet because it's still early days, but something's in the works, a lower impact version teaching high, high, high value stuff, like really high value stuff um, with a friend who, people who know me are going to guess who I'm doing it with. Um, but yeah, something's going to happen, but it can't be me sitting down and making courses and spending hours a day doing the videos, writing the scripts, the editing. This time I was clever about it. So anyone making a course, do not do your videos and then edit them at the end because it's, it's such a grind because <laughs> you have to go back through and then get your context of where you are and edit them. What I did this time was each time I recorded the video, I edited it. And then I said, that video is done. Like that's written off. I'm not coming back to it. That made it so much easier. Doing the edit on the first course, coming back and doing the edit killed me. That actually, that was the most exhausting thing. Everything else was fun. That exhausted me and that actually gave me, uh, I'm not going to say PTSD because that's ridiculous, but that gave me that feeling in your stomach where you're like, oh my God, this is just absolutely nuts. Whereas the second course, I learned my lesson. I was like, tick, tick, tick. And it was much easier. So um, yeah, that that went well. And that's, that's what happened. I'm only sharing what I've done. I'm not like a thought leader. I'm not... I just am sharing my experience and what I've done to try and help people. And I know it's helped people. And thousands of people bought serverless Laravel and single store Laravel has only been out for, I don't know, not long at all. And like loads of people have bought that and they're moving and they're solving their business problems, like CTOs, everyone. And I'm, I'm really happy about that. And so my measurement on that is how many people are benefiting from it. And like, there's lots of people benefiting from it and I'm happy. Yeah, I guess it makes a very different kind of, uh, course if it's not financially motivated like if you really want to have an impact and not just sell the course but actually it, like impact the lives of the people with it and that is your motivation it's nice to still make money and let's not forget that i feel the same way about my twitter course right we sold our business i'm, I'm fine with that like I, I don't need this course to be expensive 
to kind of sustain my cool lifestyle of sitting in my office all day. But, <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's nice to, to see some validation coming in by people opening their wallets, which is one of the best valid, kind of validation, kinds of validation that a founder could ever wish for, right? It's very, very direct. But I love that both your courses that you've put out are just a consequence of you actually having learned something that is worth teaching to people. It's just, I, I love that. That is that's so specific in terms of what you offer. You're not offering the intro to software engineering course. Right? That's not what you do. <laughs> I could. But you teach probably that. could do, right? You, <laughs> I don't you know. could try. You could try to teach uh, it, and it would be weird because you, you are such a such a specifically, I, I, I guess, capable engineer that you have so much more to say about these super specific, interesting things than the generic things that I, I guess ChatGPT could teach you that, right? Like you, that's what you would competing with, be competing with at this point. Amazing. It's just AI. I'm a storyteller. I'm a storyteller. Yeah. I like I talk about my experiences in form of stories. You know, that's one of the things I might have been as a writer of some kind if I hadn't gone into software engineering and, and SaaS. I've always written. And it was Paul that unlocked the the confidence to write because I always thought it had to be I like I, I fight with perfectionism a lot, right? And so with my writing, I'm thinking, oh, it has to be perfectly laid out and I can't have any nuance. I can't miss bits. It has to be covered in every way. There's got to be, it's got to be perfect, basically. And then I sort of just wrote something one day and Paul edited it and he had a few changes and he's like, oh, that's great. I'm like, what? And I put Paul's hugely successful newsletter, like published author, sold stupid amount of books all over the world. And he's like, oh, it's fine. Okay, what is like that was the validation I needed and that post went viral and this was back in 2018 and from that point on I just write in my voice. I've been I grew up on forums, I grew up on you know all these things. I can write, I can tweet. So now I just write blog posts in my normal voice and I find it excessively easy. And sure you can edit it. Like make a mistake, edit it. Have someone who can edit it for you. But right in your voice, that's what changed it. And I don't need to tell you, you've written more than you've written more than me, but you write in your voice and that's the key to unlock it. But uh, you've got to have a voice in the first place, I think. And maybe because I, th I think people can learn to write. I really do. Everyone has a voice. Just write how you talk. It, like, it works. Obviously, you don't put the ers and the ums, but write how you talk and then edit it. And then suddenly you've got something. That's really how I approach writing. 100%. I 100% agree with this because that's how I started writing too. Like it, and, and it's nice that you phrased it this way. Like, write, you, you find your voice, have your voice, just use your find voice. Your you already voice. have it, right? You already, you already <laughs> talk the yeah. way you talk. You, you don't need to change anything about it. And if you, can, if you can get somebody's attention for more than 20 seconds by talking about something you care about, then you can write. Like that's really what it is, because you just need to take these words that you say and put them on a page. It's really, and and I very much agree. I write the same way. I just whatever comes out. I I rarely edit. I edit for grammar. You know, that's English is a second language to me. So there's there's certainly uh, the potential for me to you know make little mistakes. But that's what Grammarly takes care of for me. I tool this uh, the stuff away. I essentially just fix fix what I say into something that resembles correct grammar, and then I just publish it too. Like I, I never do I ever read the thing again and go through it and restructure. It's not worth it. If it's a, a manuscript for a book, maybe different, but then I involve other people, just like you did with Paul, which is great. Like you had somebody who's actually a, a, a capable improvement writer look at your thing and say, yeah, sure. That's, it couldn't, couldn't get any better, right? That, that's just a, the best kind of validation you could get. But for a book, I would always get a copy editor and a proofreader, but for blog posts, particularly as fluid as they are, you could just edit it and fix it later if somebody tells you that something is not, not working, right? That's, that's not a, a physical artifact that you hand out to people like you would with a book. Blog post is a blog post. Even even a, a podcast is a 10-minute recording. Like if you ever make so many mistakes in a podcast recording, at least for me, right? Like not this one. This is a an hour recording, I guess, at this point. But at the things that I do the second episode every week that I put out, it's just like 10, 15 minutes of me thinking about something that came up in this conversation. So that is quickly re-recorded if there ever is a problem. So the effort is, is fairly low. Um, I love it. I love your writing and I love you, the, the, your approach to um, just talking it out, which is also what you do in the podcast. And I, I always wanted to ask you one thing because you have a podcast with Paul that is a podcast between friends, a podcast between business partners, and a podcast between dudes at the same time. Like there's there's many different levels. Does it ever get weird? 
Like, do you ever feel, and I mean this in the best of ways, do you ever feel like you have something that you want to talk about, but you can't because it's private and not personal? Because you can talk about personal things all the time on podcasts, but private things stay private. You don't put them into the public conversation. Do you ever run into this, this kind of difference between personal and private in those conversations with Paul? Yeah, so not on the podcast. I mean, me and Paul talk about anything and everything. Like, there's no, there's literally no limits. Um, I talk, I t- tell him about everything that's going on in my life if I, if I want to. Like, we're very good friends. Um, mm-hmm. on the podcast, I'm not going to talk about the fact that my, well, I might, no, I do actually. There are some personal things I talk about. <laughs> I will probably will mention that my dog's in a cone right now because she's had like removal of some tumors. I'd probably talk about that or the fact that I've got a cat that gets onto the podcast. I don't know. I mean, we, t- that we had, um, we had, this is this was actually just me and Sherry Walling, Rob Walling's wife, very accomplished mm-hmm. clinical psychologist, had her on the podcast. I talked about some things from my past that I think shaped me. And I, there's no, there's obviously limits, but we'll talk about stuff. We'll talk about whatever we want, to be, to be honest. I don't know. I mean, I guess we don't share every single detail. We don't share our MRR publicly because I think that that's, I don't, I don't respect that. I really don't. Um, for, for for us, people do what they do. I'm not. I don't care what people do, but I don't. So I shouldn't say I don't respect. I don't respect that. But I think more the point is that's not something we're interested in doing. Going oh, MRS up, blah blah blah. So we don't share that, but we talk about everything for the most part. There are very few limits on what we'll talk about, and we'll get into politics. We talked about communism versus capitalism, the limits of capitalism because you know, there's a limit on capitalism. Um, so we'll talk about anything, to be honest, Arvid. <laughs> yeah. and I, I love that i just wondered like are there things that we don't get to hear because obviously podcasts are edited and it's fine to to also talk about everything as well right there are so many different ways of communicating in public um that there's a spectrum i was talking to michelle hansen and colleen schnettler right both of them separately though and i, I think i asked them both about uh, how they determine what to talk about and what not talk to talk about on the podcast and they have different kind of heuristics to approach it as well which is interesting some people think yeah if it's if it serves the audience i'll talk about it and other people think well if it serves me i'll talk about it that's how different you can be Uh, no that's perceived okay that's a good okay fine so we are changing our podcast where we are focused more on the value for the audience because you know you're listening sure you're hearing paul and jack in the journey and that's fun but we want to be able to help people too and so we are focusing on structuring our podcast slightly differently so it's interesting you you brought that up we, it isn't just a kind of a, an ego thing for us to just talk um i'm not, I'm not saying i don't even know anyone that does that but it's not we do we are we're especially now starting to think more about what we're talking about like we had an episode on wealth we had an episode on you know my course we had an episode on how we did our marketing in the beginning we want that value to go to other founders because we want i, I mean yeah we really want other founders to succeed I care about other founders. I really do. I, I talk to them when I when I can. My audience isn't really software uh, SaaS founders as such. It's more engineers. A lot of engineers not knowing the first thing about marketing, which I always feel bad for them because they're genius engineers. So, but my audience is very different. Well, not very different, but it's different from yours because you have a lot of business um, focused followers. Well, I don't have as many. If I tweet about SaaS, people are like, yeah. <laughs> Whereas if you do it, people are, are there for that. So it's a it's a mixture. We get a lot of technical questions on the podcast, and you'll hear me talk about the deep dive stuff. But well, no, we do care about founders, and we you know being misled and blah blah blah, and yeah, we care about founders. Well, th- there's an interesting intersection, right, an overlap between these audiences, right? And you can you will serve both if you talk about things that concern both, and sometimes you will expand the horizon of those whose topics you don't talk about. So I think it's perfectly yeah, fine really to, to go explore. Because it's also, it's your podcast. You can talk about whatever you want. And <laughs> if it's about dogs and cones, sure, go ahead. It's it's oh, yeah. it's nice to be a human being as well. And that makes oh, yeah, people really interested, not just in the business, but also in, in you and in your, your accomplishments. And that brings me to the final question of this fine show. Where would you like people to go to follow you, your journey, your dog's journey, and you know all the other things that uh, might interest people who are both engineers, founders, or any which of those? Yeah, so usefathom.com has a newsletter. That's a pretty good place. And then Twitter, I'm Jack Ellis on Twitter. I think that's it, to be honest. Twitter and newsletter. That's all I've got. That sounds great. I think uh, I already follow you on both, so I highly recommend that. Thanks so much, Jack, for being on today hey, and sharing all you, your, your knowledge and your insights. That was really cool. Thank you.
And that's it for today. Thank you for listening to The Bootstrap Founder. You can find me on Twitter at Arvid Kahl, A-R-V-I-D-K-A-H-L. You'll find my books and my Twitter course there as well. If you want to support me in the show, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, get the podcast in your podcast player of choice, and leave a rating and a review by going to ratethispodcast.com slash founder. Any of this will really help the show. So thank you very much for listening and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.